for tonight, we could talk about 1L and how it differs from undergrad. We could talk about how to prepare yourself and set yourself up to, for success 1L semester with first year law school grades. And we could also cover a bit about law school exams and how they differ from what folks might have experienced in the past. Sure. And then anything else at all, of course. Awesome. Okay. I, can, I, think, I've, uh, I think I've mastered all those topics. So. Yeah, I, I imagine you talk about those quite a bit. I've been reliving the horrors of, of 1L for the last 20 years. So yeah. Oh, I God. I, I feel sorry for you, man. But, <laughs> but, but I guess you, you get to pay it forward, right? You get to help others along well, the way. At least I have all my hair. You know, I mean, it's, it's a bad Supercuts haircut, but it's still, it's all there. You know? <laughs> I, um, so why don't we do, what, I mean, the first question is a good one, right? Uh, because there's so, there's, you know, law school is like no other animal in terms of uh, any other academic experience that you may have, uh, you know, you may encounter, right? Um, the teaching and testing methods are entirely different. So let, let's start off on, uh, on, you know, the teaching methods um, in law school. So in, in law school, students are taught via the case method. That's the, the, the prime uh, pedagogy, uh, where, uh, well, actually, let, let's flip it around a little bit. Um, you know, in undergrad, most students are expecting, uh, you know, are, are used to the, the teaching method, which is the professor shows up the first day or two of lecture, uh, you know, sits on the edge of the desk, talks about how cool their summer was, what some of their research is, um, and then if it's a class like European history, right, they're They'll talk about, okay, we're going to cover European history from the 1800s up until the Cold War. Um, and we're going to talk about the Napoleonic Wars. We'll talk about, you know, Bismarck, the building of the German Empire. Then we'll jump into uh, World War I, you know, the Great Depression, World War II, and then ultimately the Cold War. And for the, for the next, you know, 13 weeks of the semester, your professor will, you know, show you how the roadmap she gave you at the beginning of the semester lines up with the, her view of European history, right? In, in law school, you get none of that, right? Uh, in law school, you're, again, being taught via the case method, which means that your professor shows up, you'll have show up for the first day of contracts class, let's say, um, having read a case. Um, and they'll say, hey, Steve, uh, let's talk about this case. It's Lucy versus Zemmer. You know, a drunk farmer goes into a bar uh, and, he, you know, and he, he bargains away or he bargains for the Ferguson farm. And the question is, you know, th you know, based on these facts, was there a valid offer in contract? Um, and, you know, through classroom discussion, uh, maybe you or, you know, a, a fellow classmate, uh, but not very much lecture by the professor, uh, you'll be able to distill that case down to a fine point of law. And then what happens is it's, you know, you'll read other cases throughout the semester or throughout the year, if it's a full year class, that build upon the law that you've already learned. So if you've done your job correctly and the professor's done their job, then at the end of the semester, you receive that overview of what the law of contracts looks like, all right, or the forest of tort law looks like. Uh, so it, it really is, um, you know, the, the pedagogy is almost has you, you know, wandering through a forest, right, uh, randomly planting trees, and then ultimately, at the end of the semester, you look back and say, okay, that's how the law of contracts fits together. Or that's how the, the, the law and all the rules that we learned in tort law fit together. So, you know, that in and of itself, the teaching method is really, really frustrating for a lot of students. There's not a lot of big picture. It's you're, you're instantly thrust into the weeds, always looking up saying, okay, I see sky, but where am I, you know, in relation to the other weeds and or trees and the overall forest. That does sound really difficult. So it's kind of like we have all the complexity and chaos of the real world with the real interactions and everyday experiences that people have. And then at the end of the semester, our job is to extract the general principles or rules that might underlie how the cases were decided. So actually it's done on a daily basis where you're just, you're just, you're just distilling down and um, you know, pulling out the individual rule out of each case. So it, let me, I should also just step back, um, you know, for anybody who's, you know, obviously the audience, I would assume is people who have not gone to law school. Um, you know, we, we use the case method because America has a common law system, all right, which means that most of the law that you learn comes from cases, uh, not some statute. Um, you know, very rarely will you have a class that relies heavily on a statute uh, or even, you know, I mean, even a constitution, which is like the meta law, right? Mostly you're reading cases where 
one party feels aggrieved, they sue another party uh, for some kind of damage, uh, whether it's monetary or you know, it could be criminal law where they're, you know, um, the state is suing a particular defendant uh, trying to lock them up uh, and prosecute them. Uh, but what will happen is the judge will be presented with a set of facts. And the judge will then, based on those facts, have to craft a rule of law. So it's, it's hard to imagine a, an entire body of law like contract law or tort law or criminal law or property law evolving from individual cases, but that's how it happened. But at the same time, as I tell our students, you know, first off, you know, none of this is a mystery, right? It's not that hard. Right. And I'll, you know, I don't, I don't, we've never really met before, say for one conversation, uh, you know, on the phone, but I, I'll, I'll throw a question out to you. Like, have you ever been sued for breach of contract? No, I haven't. Okay. Have you ever been sued in tort? No. Okay. Um, how is that possible? How, it's like, funny, it's a, it's a funny thing, thing, yeah. what? It's a, it's a funny thing because obviously people do have disputes in the real world, but they typically right. resolve them before it gets to legal me matters, right? Legal means. Or, I mean, or of course you could not violate it, it you could just act rationally, <laughs> not violate anybody's contract rights, right? Or property rights or tort, you know, like, you know, commit a tort. I didn't ask you about criminal law because we were all- college. I appreciate that, yeah. We were all <laughs> one time. Alcohol was certainly involved, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, so none of this stuff is really hard. Uh, it's just that, you know, in law school, what you're learning is legal theory, right? So you're learning what the rules are, but more importantly, you're learning, you know, why we have those rules. Because the law is not static either. Um, you know, when I went to law school, you know, back in the 90s, there was no internet law, you know, um, or cyber law, right? You know, Al Gore hadn't even finished the internet by the time I was, you know, get, getting through law school. So he, you know, but what'll happen is you'll, you'll have the rules of contract, you know, from these cases that come from the 1600s up to the 1800s, up to the mid 1900s, up to the early 2000s. And then boom, all of a sudden you have a, a very expanded and developed body of contract law, but you're net, met with a new medium. How do we handle contracts made over the internet? You know, can a contract be made by email? Can it be made by text? You know, when you swipe right on Tinder, is that a promise that could be enforceable? Like whatever, right? <laughs> There's all these questions that, you know, old questions. So old areas, you know, well-established bodies of law then get applied to new factual scenarios. And that's all you're doing as a lawyer, right? You're learning the foundation. You're learning the, the legal theory for these, these rules of law. And then you're presented with a new hypothetical or, or fact, which is sort of like the law school exam. And we'll get to that one in a second. Um, but, you know, if it wasn't that way, if the law was static, then you don't really need a lawyer, right? You'd have well-established cases and well-established, you could, I mean, and there are, there are jurisdictions that do that. If you want to go and live in France, it's a code system, right? Where they have a big book. And if your claim does not fall within that book, then you can't sue in, in under French law, um, where, you know, one in America, you know, somebody's donkey you know, kicks another person, right? And they sue. And then somebody's goat kicks another person and they sue. And then ultimately somebody's dog bites another person and they're relying on the, the rules that came before to establish, okay, now we have this new factual scenario. How do we handle it? Well, let's look at how we handled it in the past and then we'll, you know, apply it to this new medium, whatever it is, whatever the facts are. But I suppose what, part of what makes it so complicated is that every case is slightly different. There's... There's the dog, there's the goat, then the cars are invented, then there's the Roomba that's invented, right? right? So like every place has a slight twist to it, and then we're going to have AI with computers, right? Someone asked in the chat here about internet law. Is that something new that we have to learn? And I suppose the answer is yes, right? Because that's the world. Eventually, yeah, if you yeah. want to be employed, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you, yeah, yes, internet law is definitely something. Um, you know, cyber law is, is uh, you know, another topic. And, you know, like I said, it never existed, on, you know, on, you know, when I was in law school, but then, you know, you, you, you can't step foot on a law school campus and not have those courses offered there, right? And, you know, our, there's space law courses at some law schools now. Um, so, you know, thank God for that, 
right? Uh, and those are upper level electives. So don't, don't, don't worry about it. If you, if you don't want to take them, you don't take them. Um, but do, do so at your own peril. Because uh, eventually what you'll have to do as a lawyer is feed your family, right? And put braces on your kid. Uh, and unless you're like addicted to eating ramen noodles and you know, your entire family loves them as well, you'll want to you know, feed them well and feed them healthy. So you'll want, you'll want all these new mediums and these new facts to develop. And hopefully you can become an expert in one of them. Yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the teaching style. And that's how the teaching style differs uh, in law school. Um, and then the t- testing method is entirely different as well. Um, you know, and, and, and I say this not as an elitist, right? Um, you know, I, I didn't go to a, um, you know, a top tier law school. Uh, you know, when, when I went to, uh, I, I went to Albany Law School, which is a strong regional law school, but it was third tier law school. Uh, you know, I, I like to say it was the very top of the third tier because, you know, by the time that, you know, the U.S. News and World Report rankings got down to the third tier, they just listed them alphabetically in Albany. Was right at the top. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, I, I will say that, you know, having gone and, you know, studied at a, at, at a school that like that with a regional, um, regional reach in a, you know, in a uh, strong practical, uh, you know, emphasis on the practice of law, you, um, you know, you really have to do, make sure you're doing well, right? Uh, you know, in terms of your first year grades, right? And you have to develop a, a approach to that. And part of that is really understanding how the exam is different from anything you saw as an undergrad uh, or even high school. So, you know, by way of example, you know, um, you know, in high school, you might have been tested on, you know, and I'll go back to history because I was a history major, so entirely useless as well. I also, you know, could have majored in wiffle ball, uh, but, you know, maybe that's why, you know, I ended up at a third-tier law school. Um, so the, um, I, I, but the, you know, for history, like in American history, you might learn, you know, in high school for a civil war, you might learn the battles of the civil war, right? And, you know, what your job is as a student in high school is to, you know, memorize the dates of the battles of the civil war and go back in on your quiz or on your exam and regurgitate back those battles, right? Um, and then depending on how many you get right and, you know, the percentage of oh, 85% Steve, you get a B, right? Congratulations, right? In college, it gets a little bit more sophisticated. You know, the question might be, state the battles, the various battles of the Civil War. You've studied them, state them, and explain their significance in the overall war, right? Um, in law school, the question would be entirely different, right? In law school, it would be, okay, you've studied all the battles of the Civil War, right? Now it's the winter of 1863, and you are placed in charge of the Confederate Army, and they want to invade them. All right, develop a battle plan for based on what you know, you know, both in terms of the military strength of the the, uh, the Union at the time, uh, the weaponry available. Based, you know, you know, develop a battle plan for invading, you know, Philadelphia. And you're like, what the hell? Like, how is that? You know, that's nothing like what I learned. And, and the difference is that in law school, you're not rewarded at all for rote memorization and regurgitation, right? Uh, Pretty much everybody who goes to law school, um, you know, in your class is going to have the same brain power. Uh, that's just the fact of the matter. You, know, you, you went, you applied to a certain you, a college, you had a certain number of applicants who came in um, by, you know, by expectation of the university and by the way the, the lots are drawn. You know, there's a certain number of students who are, you know, just not going to take it seriously uh, or who are just, you know, skated in there um, and not really, you know, exercise their brain power to, you know, get the most out of college. Uh, you know, the folks who go to law school are pretty much all the folks like you who did well. And, you know, now you're sitting in a, in a classroom with them. So, you know, testing somebody on, okay, Steve, you know, give me the four elements of negligence, right? Or recite the five elements of adverse possession and property. Like, there's not a lot of value to that because, you know, you don't, A, no client will ever come into your office and be like, hey, can you tell me the five elements of adverse possession, you know, or, you know, give me the three elements of an enforceable contract, you know, like no one will ever ask you that question. Uh, what they do is they come to you with stories and they tell you a story about crazy things that happen. Uh, you might have a little lady who comes in and drops her, you know, her purse on her knees and t- starts t- regaling you with a story about, you know, how she met her husband at the USO in New- Newark, New Jersey in the 1930s and how they have 18 grandchildren and they, you know, 
he lost his hearing at the war. And you know, you're sitting here like, lady, come on, this is a free consultation, but like, let's move this thing along. And then she's like, and last week he was walking across Sixth Avenue in New York and he got hit by a FedEx truck. And you're like, what? A FedEx truck? Like, that's a deep pocket. Like, great. Okay, we can sue FedEx, right? Um, so, and that's what you're doing. So the, the exam is actually designed not to test your knowledge of the law. People, every 95% of your classmates are going to walk in with the exact same knowledge, working knowledge of the law. You're, the, the exams are written, a hypothetical fact pattern, three to five pages, um, that you know, basically ask you, you know, at the end of the, the hypothetical where people are doing super crazy things, you know, discuss the rights and liabilities of all the actors under contract law. You know? um, and you're there to take the law that you know, apply it to the hypothetical fact pattern that you probably haven't seen before, Right, it's the new. Inter it's you know, you learned the rule of contract from the 1800s. Now we're applying it to the internet, right? And then make predictions as to, as to how a court would turn out under these facts, right? Really, really different way of being tested. Um, so those are the two the, the two major things. And I would I would throw in the third, and I touched on it a little bit, is that you know the competition in law school is is kind of fierce, right? It's everyone is you know has the same brain power. Um, you're graded on a curve, so uh, you know that's you know that's foreign to a lot of students. So basically, what happens is the um, the employers want to know, hey, um, you know, don't don't waste our time, you know, letting us interview the entire class to find the students that we want to come and work at our firms or work in our office or work at our courts. We only want to see the top ten percent of the class, right? So in order to do that, you know law schools have a forced curve during the first year where only a certain number of A's can be given, only a certain number of B's, C's and B's, and, you know, even F's. So for the first time, a lot of students, you know, depending on where they go to law school, if they had a C curve, they could experience getting a C for the first time in their life. Uh, because it's not, again, it's not about me going in there, doing an information dump on the, on the paper, and, you know, you looking down the suppressor and saying, okay, well, Don knew 85% of this material, therefore he gets a B. You know, it's more Don knew this much in relation to Steve, therefore he gets a B, right? Um, so it, it, it's, it's a really entirely different way of, of grading. Uh, so the teaching, testing, and grading methods um, typically throw a lot of people. That is really something. And it's kind of funny you bring that up about the, the, the fierce curve that law school has because – a lot of times for the LSAT, people are shocked at how poorly they do on a percentile basis. But right. again, the competitor pool is once again, a lot more fierce, even when you're applying to law school, it's a more competitive applicant pool for law school than you would have applying to undergrad. And then right. it gets even more fierce when you actually are in law school, because not everyone who takes the LSAT actually makes it to law school. Right. Yeah, and imagine the bar is even harder after that. So it kind well, of keeps... the, bar, the bar is three years down the road. Do not worry about the bar. Not nothing to worry. Yeah, true. Nothing to worry about at the moment. Yeah, just make it through one L first. Right, right, right. right. Um, and when, once you start talking about percentiles, like to a lawyer, you know, I, my eyes glaze. We're all lost. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Is that he's talking about math now? I don't know. But I went to law school to avoid math, so right. <laughs> I just you know I, I know the curve and I know which side I think you're supposed to be on. Right. Uh, that's, yeah, whatever, whatever side you're on of that bell curve is really good. Right. The other interesting thing that's sticking out to me is this parallel, once again, between the LSAT and law school with principle and application. Right. Like in the LSAT, we have logical reasoning section with fact patterns. You have to spot the issues, extract them, maybe take a general principle and apply it to yet another situation. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly. And basically, that's what you're doing with, with case law analysis and synthesis. Um, you're taking various rules from different cases. You might have the drunk farmer on this case. You might have the guy playing a joke on his friend on this case and then saying, okay, how do you meld those rules into one rule that covers offer in contract? Um, and it's, it's tough, but you know, it's doable. I mean, it, it has to be doable. And you know, again, the, the nice thing about it is you know, in law school where students struggle is up until that point, they've only survived with a yes or a black and white yes or no answer, right? In law school, the answer is always, it depends, you know? It depends on how you look at those facts. It depends on how you read these facts. It depends on what A was going to do in relation to what B did, right? So all those things, I mean, the, you know, the tool chest for a lawyer is, you know, consists of three 
tools, essentially. Factual, legal, and policy arguments, right? Um, and making those arguments is their craft. So, you know, you look at a great lawyer like David Boyce, you know, he, he could convince anybody of anything, right? Uh, you know, arguing uh, a, certain, a certain way, with, whether it's factual arguments, in fact, you know, a fact argument or an example of a fact argument, I should say, is um, imagine you're, you know, indicted for murder, right? Um, and, you know, your factual argument is, hey, I wasn't in New York at the time of the murder where it happened. I was in Philadelphia, right? Very strong factual argument, right? Um, you know, a, a legal argument would be you're indicted for murder. Yeah, I killed the guy, but he was coming at me with a knife, right? So you have a legal excuse, uh, um, uh, a justification of self-defense, right? And then the, a policy argument, you know, needs to go in strength, a uh, policy argument that a lawyer would use would be, you're indicted for murder, it wasn't self-defense, but your argument is going to be, look, I did, this, I did society in the world a favor, this person was gonna grow up to be the next Hitler, right? So, I mean, obviously the weakest of the three, still an argument, um, but all, all furthering different parts of the criminal law in terms of justification for acquittal and or some kind of a you know, lesser, lesser degree of homicide. So those, those, are, those are just you know, three tools that a lawyer learns. And what you're doing throughout the entire first year is collecting those arguments and then just waiting to present, be presented with a new fact pattern where it's a, it's, you know, you've got yourself a square peg um, and it's got to fit into a round hole. And how do I shave those arguments down so they all fit? Wow, very interesting. So yeah. in law school, are students actually on their, on their exam and their the exams and their essays, are they actually applying each of those three kinds of arguments? Typically. Or do only some, only some, all three apply? Typically, typically, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, as a lawyer, um, you know, you're going to make arguments in the alternative, right? You know, Steve is not guilty. However, if he is guilty, we still have a good excuse, right? You're always making these arguments in the alternative. So to the extent that they exist on a typical fact pattern, yeah, you would make those arguments. Oftentimes, the, the, and the other thing about the, the hypothetical fact patterns that are given on the exams is they're purposely written with ambiguity, right? They're, ri they're ri the, the, right, I should say, you know, ripe with ambiguity because you know, the professor, again, is not testing your knowledge of contract law or court law or property or criminal law or constitutional law or civil procedure. They know you know it. Right? They know you've memorized it. Now show me you've mastered it so, so much so that you can apply it. And each one of those, um, you know, where, where a lot of students get locked up is, oh, my God, you know, I, I see the ambiguity, but it's really just easy to just ignore that and go with, he's guilty, right? Um, or um, he should be acquitted, uh, you know, or there's no liability, whatever, the, whatever type of case it is. Um, the true hallmark of a good exam, the true like great A plus student is somebody who can identify that amb ambiguity and embrace it and then just like ring it out, right? Let me tell you about this guy's arguments are gonna be really strong here. However, the other side, professor, because you were so cl clever in how you wrote this exam is gonna have these great arguments as well. And at the end of the day, the conclusion could be, who the hell knows, I don't know. You know, I think B has good arguments, but maybe A should win based on, you know, the overall policy of do we want to reward that kind of behavior? It, it's really, it, it, at the end of the day, the conclusion, whether somebody is right or wrong, I mean, I, I've walked out of exams and I did the, you know, the thing that you should never do on a, um, after a law school exam is, is ask your classmates, well, so what did you think? What did you get? <laughs> right? Because, they, you know, it's like, the LS, it's like the LSAP, right? It's like, who walks out of that exam feeling like they, they killed them? right? You know, only people probably who fail, you know, are like, you know, like, oh, that was easy, nothing. And you're like, okay, good luck. Um, you know, good luck to you. But the, um, you know, you know, I had people say like, oh, you know, like oh, antitrust exam. And one of my best friends, I was like, what'd you think there? I told him that the FTC should like lock the CEO up for trying to do that merger. It was like completely illegal. And my friend was like, no way, they should be commended. They should have been given an award for that. And we both got A's, you know, because it doesn't really matter which way you come as long as you identify the, the issues and then argue both sides. 
Dude, it's so funny. You're actually making me want to go to law school. Don't. I, just, don't, I never don't. went to law school. I, I got stuck with the LSAT and stuck with that. Never continued on my journey. But the, the ambiguity that you're talking about with these fact patterns is so interesting to me because what you're getting at is that the conclusion that you argue for is not nearly as important as the way in which you go about making a reasoned argument. And the real world's complicated. Things aren't black and white. I think the nuance is what they're looking for to see that you can recognize. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing about these fact patterns are, is they're four pages, right? You have an hour and a half or two hours, maybe three hours to complete the exam. But for that one hypothetical fact pattern, you might have an hour and a half, okay? These questions could take weeks to analyze. So it's a high pressure, high stakes exam, right? And the professors know that. So, you know, the, at the end of the day, the ultimate conclusion, like if given a law library and all of the billable hours, like, you know, it, it's so funny because, you know, in law school, you're taught to be really good with your time on an exam, you know, but in practice, you know, you're, you know, rewarded for inefficiency because you're billing by the hour, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it's the exact opposite. But what they're trying to do is replicate what happened in practice. You know, that client comes in, tells you this crazy ass story, and you're supposed to, with with uh, and you know most law school exams are open book right so you can bring whatever books you want but like again as i tell students it's like you know a student who brings a book to a law school exam thinking that they're going to use it you know they're a fool i mean because every time every second that you spend looking up an answer right that you could have memorized before is another second that somebody else is right right so you treat these books you treat the exams like they're closed book exams but professors know that like these these hypothetical fact patterns are written in such a way that it could take weeks, literally weeks, to fully analyze the question. Um, and all they want to see is, can you quickly identify what are the legal, legally significant facts? Because the question is not going to jump out and say, am I a contract? Or was there a breach? You know, It's just going to tell you a story, and you're going to say, ah, that's a breach, right? Or that's failure to perform, or that's substantial performance, or that's, you know, requires, um, you know, uh, restitution damages, or that requires you know, expectation damage, or whatever, uh, just because of the facts. So I guess what you're referring to then is issue spotting, right? Yep, yep, yeah. So th that, I mean, issues, I, I like to tell students it's not really issue spotting, it's dispute spotting. So if you're able to identify the overall dispute, usually what will happen is one of those elements, so let's say there are four elements of an enforceable negligence claim, right? You're slip and fall, somebody hits you with a car, that kind of a negligence claim, right? There's, you know, there's a duty, there's a breach of that duty, there's a causation, you know, so that breach caused some kind of harm, the fourth element, right? And usually what will happen is the story will piece together four of those, three of, the, three of those elements pretty well, but the fourth element, the missing element, whether it's the causation or whether it's the actual breach or whether it's the, the harm or did the person even owe a duty, right? That's going to be kind of hazy right? So the dispute is negligence. The issue is that, that discrete issue uh, or that discrete element that you're going to be arguing with. It's literally, you know, I tell students, when you think of the word issue, it's where the parties will literally take issue with one another about the, the facts of the case. Okay. Good to know. So we've got the, I think you've given us a great overview of what law school is like and how it's different from undergrad. How many people, how many people have we lost? Because now I'm thinking like, holy Christ, I'm scaring these guys. No, no, our audience numbers are only going up right now. So <laughs> apparently they like what you're saying. <laughs> so we've identified the problem. And now I suppose it's a good, it's, folks have some questions, but also I obviously we want to get to the solution of how to prep for this, given that we're in the spring right now. Folks are looking to probably start law school this fall. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if they're gunners, they're looking to go next fall. Right. And so I guess the question is, how do you prep do you study law first? Do you study how to study? What, what can someone do the summer before law school? Well, let, let, me, let me take one step back and sure. just cover something that you covered you know, at the beginning uh, to tee up why you'd want to prep for first year. Uh, and that's the importance of your first year grades, right? So uh, 1L grades are by far the most important grades you'll receive in law school. Um, yeah, and the, the reason is pretty simple. Again, as I mentioned before, you know, an employer would come to a law school and say, look, do not waste our time. You know, we're, when I used to interview, you know, by the luck and by the shock to everybody who knew me, all right, growing up, most, mostly my family, 
all right? After my first year of law school, I was number four in my class, okay? Which, you know, got me that big job that I thought I wanted in Manhattan before I realized, like, wow, there's got to be a better way to use my law degree than, you know, making fidelity even richer. Um, so, but, you know, when I was practicing law, I would go and sit in a, um, you know, conference room every fall uh, and with myself and another associate uh, and go interview students, right? Um, and, you know, the idea is don't waste our associates' time. You know, these, these two guys are billing out at $400 an hour. That's $800 an hour that's sitting in a library somewhere. Don't waste our time. We won't waste your students' time. Only send us students who have these criteria. They're the top 5% of their class, so the top 10% of the class, and they're on law review, okay? Uh, law review is a quasi-honor. It's, um, it's a student-run publication. Uh, you know, typically synonymous with, you know, people who are at the very top of their one on class get an invitation onto law or some other journal uh, where they review uh, professors' articles. It's sort of like peer review article and, uh, where a professor will, you know, a cutting edge issue of, of law comes down out of a particular court, a professor will analyze it, and students will then edit that article and publish it, right? So basically saying, hey, look, this is where the law is going right? Reviewing the, the current state of the law. Um, so employers are, are very cognizant of, you know, their associates' time. And they're like, don't waste it. Don't waste our time. And don't waste, you know, our partner's time when you get called back to the office. We only want to see certain students. Um, and usually it's, it's cut on the first year grades. So the most selective legal employers, you know, will only really interview the very top of their first year classes, Okay. Uh, so that's, that places a lot of emphasis on your first year grades. And I even go further to say, as somebody who's horrible at math, I at least could figure this one out. Um, it's not even about your first year grades. It's about your first semester grades, right? Because you're front loading so many credits during your first year that if you're able to knock it out of the park in the fall semester, it is damn near impossible mathematically to catch you by, you know, by doing well your second semester. If you, if you don't do well your first semester, and try to catch up, it's really hard, right? By contrast, you don't want to be in the group of people who don't do well their first semester uh, and are trying to play catch up. It's possible, you know, but so is anything. You know, it's, it's possible I might finally meet Beyonce, but, you know, and, you know, rap battle Jay-Z and win, but it's not going to happen, you know? It's unlikely, I should say. Um, so in any event, though, like, that's the important thing. Doing well your first semester is really key. Um, so, you know, in terms of what we do in, in terms of prep, um, you know, I, I recognize pretty early on that there's not a lot of, uh, you know, study materials. Uh, if you went out, if you wanted to try to buy a, a commercial outline for tort law or for contracts or property or go out and buy a couple study aids that try to explain contracts in a nutshell, they're not written for an audience of lay people. Like, you really can't just sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to teach myself property. Um, you know, I, I guess there are people out there who can do it, right? Um, but, you know, the overwhelming majority of those, those study aids are, are written for an audience of people who are current first-year law students, who are reading the cases, who are going to class, listening and participating in the classroom discussion, grappling with this law, and now just need some clarity. Like they walked out of Monday's class more confused than when they walked in. What the hell was that professor saying? Let me try to figure it out by looking at a commercial outline. But for your average person to sit around, you know, go to Jones Beach over the summer um, and, you know, whip out their manual law outline and start reading it, it's, it's kind of useless, to be honest with you. Um, so when we started Law Preview, uh, you know, I, I designed it with four fellow associates of mine. We were, we were all working at a, a large law firm in New York. Um, they, uh, I'm the only one who jumped ship. I, you know, I spent, uh, you know, I, I'm the one who had the entrepreneurial bug to say, okay, I'm going to quit my job. And, and, uh, you know, sometimes felt like I tore up a winning lottery ticket, especially now, like one's a partner at Skadden, you know, one's a partner at Sidley. And I'm like, damn, what was I thinking? Um, but at the same time, you know, like, you know, I also know my kids. So like, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, the, uh, but, you know, when we were looking at what would be helpful for students is, you know, first off, to combat the case method, right? The, the, pedag uh, the pedagogy that I mentioned before when we first started out the conversation, that building block approach where at the end of the semester you see what the body of contract law looks like 
what we do is if you're going to take the class and you're welcome to come if you want to you know, sort of get the experience of law school i'd love to have you thanks yeah um, sounds fun you know uh so we do it at columbia we have um uh in new york we have jody kraus uh who's a professor of contract law at columbia he's written a case book on the on the topic so these are subject matter experts um and the idea is you know i hire people uh professors who regularly teach on the subject and are, who, who are pretty much recognized you know, as experts in the subject uh, for, the, for the sole purpose of you know, getting back to that idea that if, if you can really master something, you can explain it to a four-year-old, right? And then I pack the room you know, with you know, entering law students, most of whom have never been exposed to law, right? Um, and Jody will then take them on a monorail tour of contract law, right? He'll start out with where contract law comes from. Here's why we have it. Here's all the major theories that are driving this area of the law. Here's how you form a contract. Here's how you, you know, uh, defend the formation of a contract, say that a, a contract was not formed. Here's how you breach a contract. Here are defenses to breach. And then ultimately, here's how you, you know, collect damages if a contract was breached. And the idea is that after six hours, you know, sitting in the room with an expert, you know, having them really lecture and explain something, as I said before, that's not that hard. Right again, because we we know these rules in you know internally. We're not out there breaching contracts all the time for a reason, right? Because we know the rules. We just don't know what they're called, right? Or we don't know why we have them. But what uh, somebody like Jody can do is take you on this monorail tour of contract law, and then have you look out the window and see a thirty thousand foot view of contracts, right? So what that does, I, I sort of explain it, is like you you're in New York, I'm up on on the Cape. Um, you know, if, if I said to you, okay, before you leave your house tonight, you're going to drive up and see me, you know, would you rather me, you know, surprise you every exit with a new direction, or would you rather have a GPS overlay of where we go, right? Yeah, you want to see the roadmap ahead of you. Right. And that's, that's all we're doing, right? So we're providing them with a, the forest of contract law. So when they're doing the cases, they're not doing it in a vacuum. You know, they're reading these cases, they're distilling them down to a fine point of law and be like, ah, this has to do with contract formation. It's coming here. It's planted in this part of the forest. I know damages is coming. I know breach is coming. Um, but that's not until later. It's like sort of like knowing the punchline to a bad joke. I'm right here in the forest, right? And this is where I have to stay. This is my, this is my dance space right now. So that's, that, that's the substantive overview. We do that with all of the classes. Again, written for an audience um, of you know, folks who have no experience in law. It, and, you know, it doesn't matter if they're paralegals or not, because again, you know, as I tell paralegals, it's like the most dangerous thing to be in law school, because you walk in thinking that you know the law, and you do. You know how to practice law. But in law school, you're not learning practical skills at all. You're learning legal theory. And that becomes very dangerous. A little bit of knowledge can go a lot, you know, can become very, very dangerous, especially in the hands of a paralegal. Um, so I'm not, I know I'm probably getting comments now that, you know, don't bash the paralegals, um, but uh, truth hurts. Um, so the, uh, but then the other half of the class is a strategy component on how, how to do well your first year, you know, based on, based on everything, right? Uh, so uh, you know, all the skills that you need uh, in terms of case briefing, case law analysis, outlining, note taking. We have a four hour exam taking strategy lecture at the end of the week where you actually take a law school exam. Um, and apply the argument, you know, the arguments that you learned in tort law, contract law, whatever the question is. Um, so I like to tell students that, you know, especially the first semester, you know, the, you know, when you walk onto a law school campus, the learning curve is not a curve at all. It's like a right angle, right? It, you're, it just smacks you right in the face. Um, and if you don't do any kind of prep, if you're not, if you're not even prepared for the experience, um, you know, it, that, that learning curve is very severe, right? Um, and with so much riding on your first year grades, it's a tough time to be learning substance and skills. So while I can't eliminate the learning curve entirely, um, what I can do is I can make it a more gentle slope. I can make it a 15 degree slope, uh, which is really you know, appreciated when the entire class is trying to play catch up in climbing up this learning curve that is a lot, that's a lot steeper. You know, and also has no game plan for how to attack the first semester. Oh, well, it sounds enormously useful. I, I love the idea of being able to do a full law school exam. 
before you actually start law school. And then I imagine you give them feedback also on what they wrote. Better than that, we give them model answers, right? Nice. And they go through, they go through the, um, the exam with a real law school professor to say, okay, here's what I like. Here's what I'm looking for. See how he does this. See how she did that. Um, and they, they go through, and usually, obviously, the, their work product, the student's work product is, you know, is what you would expect. Um, you know, it's, it's a one-week course. It, it, it's really less about, you know, showing them how to, uh, you know, showing them the law that they've mastered in the one week. Um, although, you know, shockingly, I've had students come to me and say, like, I learned more in this one week of law preview than I learned in all of undergrad, which, you know, if they're college career was anything like mine, where I basically just played wiffle ball and, you know, was a history major, it's entirely possible. Um, but the, um, but usually what they, the, the purpose of that exercise is really to drop them in a cold bucket of water and say, this is what a law school exam is going to look like, right? Here's how you take a hypothetical fact pattern and deconstruct it and then reconstruct it into an A plus answer. It, it's a skill that, you know, it's, you know, None of the stuff that we teach in law preview is something that people will never learn. Well, everyone gets it, right? It's just a matter of when they get it, right? And, you know, some people will get it second semester. Some people, some people will get it first semester, you know, without, without a law school prep course. Some people will get it second semester. A lot of people start to get it second year. And that's when they, you know, they come back and they're like, damn it. You know, like, had you told me this is what you were looking for, right, I would have done it, Right. Uh, because again, law school is, you know, it, you know, the law is not that confusing and law school is really not that hard if you know how to attack it. Well, Don, it sounds like you're giving people a dry run so that they can make at least the bulk of their mistakes yeah. before they even start. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And back to what you said earlier, where like second semester, you're already playing catch up if that's when you start learning things. Right. And that's, 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 a, that's an unenviable position to be in. You do not want to be there. Right. What about this? What about the Socratic method? How important is it to be prepared for the cold calling? I don't care. So I have, I have, so I practice radical honesty. If you haven't guessed yeah. already, okay. Sure. Um, That's why I'm asking. <laughs> why? That's why I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. So you know, there's certain things that I, I don't care about. You know, and and I'll I'll tell students and they'll laugh, but I'll be like, no, I'm dead, pretty dead serious. Like, you know, after first year, I don't care if you buy the books or not. I don't care if you go to class or not. Right. It, law school is a one year sprint not a three-year marathon, right? So people who are running a three-year marathon are in running the entirely wrong race, okay? Similarly, I don't care how you do in the Socratic method. Um, I, you know, if, it, if you're scared of getting called on, so what? Everybody is, all right? Your entire class does not want to be called on, all right? Your professor walks in the room and everyone's eyes just drop. Nobody wants to be called on, right? Um, and then, you know, it's sort of sharks and minnows, right? Somebody gets picked off. You know, Steve, it's you're in the hot seat. Let's talk. And all, all of a sudden, there's like a collective sigh of relief. Like, ah, all right. But even there, like, no, no one's like sitting there and being like, Steve, what a jerk, dummy. How'd you get that wrong? They're all like, Steve, please, you know, please get this right. All right. Because they know that if like you get it wrong, the press will be like, no, 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 no. How about you, John, over there? And John's like, please, no, I don't want to get, I don't want to be called on. So the, the, in terms of the, the cutthroatness and in terms of the, camaraderie of of law school like you build your best friends in law school even though you're competing fiercely with, with them against grades there is that minnows versus shark mentality um but at the end of the day the other thing that i love to you know tell students is how well you do on you know in class has zero bearing on your grade so what do you care uh, let, let's worry about things that matter I, I have a philosophy that you know with my kids um that you know and they're Typical teenagers, right? They don't think I know anything. Um, but I'm constantly talking them off the ledge that, hey, look, if it's not going to matter five years from now, we're not going to worry about it, right? So, like, you know, save for you getting pregnant, killing somebody, like, in a car wreck, or, you know, doing something stupid. Some of those things, some things like that would matter five years from now, all right? But the bulk of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is not going to matter five years from now. So lower your anxiety. Getting called on in class is one of those things. It has zero bearing on your grade. All the exams are, are graded anonymously, right? So, you know, they, the professor has no idea whether Steve Schwartz wrote the, the, the A answer or Don McCauley wrote the A answer. Um, it, you can't be the classroom or the teacher's pet. Um, so, by contrast, if you screw up, 
right, it, it, you know, in your answer, um, first off, the professor is guiding you towards that, right, because they want to make it a teaching moment, right? They want you to get your answers wrong in class so you're not eventually representing a client or standing up in front of a judge and making stupid arguments, right? They, they want you to be able to think through these things uh, and think on your feet. So oftentimes, the professor is leading you down a path for you to get it wrong, all right? Um, so, but there's no shame in that. And again, it has no bearing on your grades, so don't worry about it, right? I mean, that, that's my philosophy. No, that makes a lot of sense. The grades are what matters, as you said earlier. It's all about 1L in particular in fall semester. I mean, the uh, other thing about grades I should just say is, you know, in law school, there are no pop quizzes. There are no papers to write. So the things that you had as a gauge for how well you're doing in, you know, college or in high school, um, you know, leading up to the final exam, that's worth 30% of your grade. In law school, it's worth 100% of your grade, right? So, like, it, it, you know, there's not a lot of positive affirmations either coming at you on a daily basis. You're sort of, like, floating through this, like, am I doing this right? You know, do I have a system to understand? And, and, and that's something that we, we address, you know, in terms of using the case briefs as a, um, a daily quiz to identify for yourself, hey, am I getting this? Like, do I have the confidence to walk into the final exam saying, like, I understand 90% of this material. You know, I, I got it up until this point. I think I should be okay. Otherwise, you're sitting there walking in, like, depending on whether you're a pessimist, like, oh, my God, I know nothing. Or, you know, I'm an optimist, like, oh, my God, I got 100 on the exam and I can only lose points at this time. Um, you know, that's how you walk into a final exam that's worth everything. And that's another thing that, you know, places a lot of pressure on students during the first year. Um, and that's something you worry about. You know, that, that's something that, again, will matter five years from now because your first year grades, as I hit on before, really can change the trajectory of your legal career. Right, right. I, I like the idea of those case briefs as like a regular check-in yeah. for where you're at. So you're not waiting till the end of the semester with the exam before you find out whether you know something or not. Right. And I'm sure there's like a thousand questions already being like, oh, my big brother went to law school and said I didn't have to brief a case. <laughs> well, whatever. I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a little more old school, right? You know, I basically, you know, we, you know, there's a, a correct way and an incorrect way of briefing cases. And there's a way that you can sort of use it as a daily quiz and check yourself. Uh, and that's what I'm more, you know, more interested in for students. Okay. And you could also say, well, what's the risk averse strategy? What's the, what's the practical strategy? Should you brief the cases or should you just do nothing and wing it till and wait till later? Dude, I mean, and you sound <laughs> like a lawyer because lawyers are what? Risk averse. Right. That's exactly. All we do is manage risk, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, but that's why we like, you know, I was thinking before we even got on this call, I'm like, how does this guy know I'm even going to show up? Like, you know, he emailed me. I never replied. He emailed me one more time. Here's the link. And like, I never, I'm like, this guy has like, there's no contract on my side. Like if I didn't show up, I guess my reputation makes me want to like, want to show up. But like as a lawyer, I would be like, Steve, Tuesday, Steve, confirm, Steve, I want it in writing, Steve, I will have your first born. You know, like, you know, like if you don't show up, like, again, as a lawyer, all we're doing is managing risk, you know? So maybe you should go to law school. I, I had it by my whole juggling kit in the corner. I was just going to enter perform for everybody. You didn't. A little magic. All yeah, right. a little magic show. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've got some questions here from the audience. You want to dig into these a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go through it. All right. So we've got one from Jordan asking, are there certain undergrad majors who may do better in law school? If you're a pre-law major, does that help for law school? Not really. No. I mean, it, it, and, and, you know, Unfortunately, law is sort of like medicine, um, you know, which I guess biology would help in medicine, okay? Um, but, you know, what I tell students, you know, in terms of their undergrad, and my daughter's a sophomore at Oberlin, right, in Ohio. Um, and, you know, my advice to her is enjoy yourself. Don't grow up too quickly. Um, you know, the most important lessons you'll learn in college are social skills, um, how to talk to somebody that you don't really want to talk to, how to deal with a roommate who leaves dishes in the sink. I mean, like, you want to talk about big problems, that's like big stuff um, that you should be picking up in your four years of college, all social skills. Um, but when you get to college, like, you know, or when you get to law school, the stuff that you learned in undergrad may not really prepare you like there's again you know you could be an english major and have written a bunch of papers or a history major um there's no term papers to write right a pre-law um i mean i guess depending on what you're studying as a pre-law major 
I guess that could impact. I, I don't know. Um, my 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 inkling is to tell you do what you love, right? If if you do what you like, you'll you know a you know from a, a learning standpoint, it won't feel like learning, right? It'll feel like a hobby, um, and even a work standpoint, like you'll never have to work a day in your life if you're doing what you like. Um, so th where where the undergraduate could come back in on you know underneath is not to help you in law school; it's to complement what you do with your law degree, right? So like say. Uh, God, please, all right, you're a computer science major, right? And you want to couple that with a law degree? Well, God bless you. Like, I would, you know, I would implore that you either adopt me or take one of my kids, you know, the one that we don't like, all right? Um, because you will have more money than God because you'll be combining a knowledge of science and computer science, right, with intellectual property law, which is super hot right now, right? You, you, you can't find yeah, uh, you know, a, a engineering or computer science um, background person who goes to law school. So if you can do that, by all means, like do that. Anything with the hard sciences, uh, and but if it interests you, um, but don't choose a major because you think it's going to help you in law school. It probably won't. Philosophy, maybe a little bit, um, but that's just a matter. I mean, you don't have to take a philosophy major. You can just take a couple of philosophy classes and understand rhetoric um, and argue, understand argument, and then be done with it. Um, and for, for law school admissions, you also have your undergraduate GPA to consider. Right. Exactly. So that's, again, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to take a course load of stuff that you think is just going to help you prepare for law school, but it's not of interest to you, then you're likely not going to do very well in undergrad. So I would just do the things that really make you happy. Right. And then, you know, have a, have a good time in college because law school, you know, as, as fun, it's a different kind of fun, but it's not the same kind of freedom fun that you would have. Um, the four years of there's certain things when you get gray hair like this you start thinking like damn i gotta live my life backwards because <laughs> i've got some knowledge now um you know and i could i could have done some serious damage had i known this is how the system worked. right, right. we got a question about barbary 1l mastery versus law preview what's the difference and what order should people do them and if they were going to do both okay so uh 1l mastery is a study aim Okay, so again, written for an audience of students who are currently in law school grappling with the material. It's a series of, you know, um, review lectures on video. So basically what Barbary is. Um, so B Barbary acquired Law Preview, um, and now I'm working for the man. Um, You're like a gazillionaire now, right? What's that? You're like a gazillionaire now, right? I wish. I wish. You exit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. My kids think so, but no, I'm not. Um, so Barbary is a company that, that is, is best known for a bar review course. So after you go through three years of law school, um, they, you know, run you through this, you know, seven week program that says, Hey, Steve, remember tort law? Here's what tort law is. And here's how they're going to test it on the bar exam. And these are all the rules you need to know. And remember contract law? It's been three years. Let me show you. Let me give you a quick refresher. It's a review class. So they put out a study aid called 1L Mastery, which basically is they take videos from their bar review lectures on torts, property, criminal law, all the first year classes, contracts, and then they package it as a review lecture. So when you're going to study for your final exam, it's these are the rules of contract law and this is what they are, all right, down in the weeds. What law preview is, is a course. It's not a study. Aid. And in fact, you know, if you take law preview, you get 1L Mastery for free. So please do not buy both, all right? Um, but you, law preview, as I described before, is written for an audience of people who have not stepped foot on a law school campus, right? And it's to provide them with a really solid foundation of what contract law is, what courts, property, all those first year subjects are, and how they look from a 30,000 foot view, and then the skills on how to attack the first year. So that's how they differ. Uh, very, very different. But I mean, like, you can buy the one on mastery um, set. I'm sure, you know, you, you can buy them. Uh, it's just, I don't think it's going to make much sense and it won't have much utility to you until about November. When you'll be like, oh, that's what they're talking about. Okay, now I see how it all, that, how that fits together with those rules because they're really down in the weeds in those review lectures where, you know, you're just not ready for that. You're, it's, it, it's like not only running, it's like, you know, the 40 yard dash, you know, um, to learning how to fall. Right. Thanks for that, Don. And we have another question related somewhat. And I was thinking this too. You mentioned that law previews 
live. You said it was at Columbia, and but then there's also you said it was written, and there's also a, apparently a recorded version. Yes. So there's yes. some different options out there for folks, I guess, based on geography. But could you go into those a bit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, and it's, it's it's become more like I always thought. You know, I was the full resistor to we're not going to do law preview online. You know, you can't replicate the experience of, um, you know, having somebody come and sit in the classroom with Jody Krause and, you know, learn contract law from somebody like him, right? Um, and then we ran a test last year with our first live stream session. So basically, I guess what you're doing now, with like, I'm, we do a live stream, not through Facebook, it's through this, um, through this, uh, this web app where people were piping in to a class that we were you know, live streaming from Emory Law School last year. Um, and, you know, in an effort to, uh, you know, obviously cut down on travel costs, a lot of people can't travel um, to, the, to the session, uh, can't get, you know, time off from work. Um, so they, you know, they live stream in uh, rather than, you know, incur these different costs, time or, or money. Um, and it literally is just like being in the, uh, so now I'm like, damn, like, I don't, do we even need to run these things live? Because, you know, even down to the questions, um, you know, that the instructors might really professionally mic'd, the room actually is mic'd as well. But then there's also like, if Steve has a question, there's this like box, this phone box. Like, if, have you ever seen this? I'd, I'd never oh, seen it. That sounds cool though. Oh, no, no. So like these kids are like, now I'm sitting here thinking like, holy shit, someone is going to be like hit in the head with this box and I'm going to get sued. Like now we're thinking about waivers, you know, but like it's a phone box and they, like they, they throw it. And then as soon as it lands, like, so in the air, the mic turns off. So there's no residual noise. As soon as it lands and stops, it turns on and the kid asks the question. So, you know, it, it is literally like being in the room and then to, you know, to help students, you know, relate with the class, we have a student instructor, somebody who took law preview the last year um, who did really well. Right. So some of the questions like a handle go up on online and the student moderator will either answer the question directly like, oh, the professor said this, and this is what he meant, or, or oh, the professor um, said this, let me ask her. Uh, you have, that's a good question, that, and that wasn't asked. Let me, let me raise my hand. And then the student basically asks the question for the person online. It, it, it literally is like being. Um, so that's, that's the live stream. We run two of those, uh, one earlier in the summer from Chicago, another one um, uh, from LA. I do both of those. Uh, the only reason you know, we, we don't do New York is I learned my lesson last year. I got too many complaints. Uh, the only complaints that we got for the, for the live stream was, Jesus Christ, why did you have this thing on the East Coast? I'm waking up at four in the morning to take this goddamn class. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we, we were, everyone was based on the East Coast. So we decided to run a central time zone. And then later in the summer, we have a Pacific time zone. Um, so you can type in that way. Or this year, we're actually recording the first one. Um, and you could, you know, for lack of a better word, binge watch it uh, during the summer. So there's an on-demand version for people who really can't make it. And that's for folks who can't work and, you know, or who have to work but want to take law preview for, you know, two hours in the evening because we only run the class from 7.45 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon. It's a, it's a, it's a long class. It is a, I, I will tell you, again, you know, the, on, uh, the other only complaint we ever get from students is like, Christ, you really have to tell people how hard this is. Uh, because it's a lot of work. Um, but, you know, I, we also have kids coming back and say, like, I was number one in my class, and I'm glad I did law school this way, because, you know, I was going to treat law school like undergrad and, you know, quickly realize from how my friends did it, um, that would have been a huge mistake. Yeah, well, better now than later, right? Exactly. Yeah. We got one comment saying, this is wonderful information, and you're really entertaining. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I, 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 said, I was hoping want... the comment was going to be like, I was really open for and you look like Bradley Cooper, you know, given <laughs> that damn movie. All right? as, I, as I said to the person, as I sat down in the, uh, the uh, you know, super cut haircut uh, chair, she's like, what do you want? I'm like, my wife says I have to walk out of here looking like Bradley Cooper. So do your best. So <laughs> thank you. I, I try to be entertaining. <laughs> well, I guess if they want more, they should take the class, right? <laughs> All right. So we got one question about moot court versus mock trial versus law review. Mm -hmm. Are these worth the time? Is it, is it okay? Is it possible to do both or is it too much of a drain? Uh, yeah. So uh, all of those things are extracurricular activities that you would do during your second year, uh, except for mock trial. Mock trial is the trial teams that usually take place during the third year. Um, so moot court um, is essentially a, um, 
you know, in an inter-school appellate advocacy competition where you learn how to you argue an appellate case. Um, you know, among your, you know, you pair up with one other person, you write the appellate brief, you write the respondent's brief, things you'll learn about, you know, uh, you don't have to stress out about now. Uh, and then you argue them before a series of judges. And depending on how far you get in the, in the tournament, um, the judges might get more and more prestigious. You might have, you know, um, you know, a Supreme Court justice. Uh, I know that Scalia used to come down to Georgetown and be the final, you know, one of the judges in the panel for the final uh, round of moot court at Georgetown, right? Uh, pretty cool stuff, right? Um, but that's stuff that you don't have to worry about until your second year. Uh, the one thing I, I will say is that in terms of a legal career, you want to be on law review, right? Again, law review is that, you know, student-run publication, which is, you know, it's like a special club. Like, you don't, you know, once law review is on your, on your resume, it never falls off. Um, so the last thing, um, you know, it, it, it's one, one of those things that, you know, when you go for a job interview and they see that, Steve, oh, you're on law review. You're on law review, too. You know, it's like, sort of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're a member of the club. Um, that, that's one of those things that, you know, you want, you, you sort of have to do. That, that's, if you get invited to do that, you don't make the decision not to. Um, the two things, law review and moot court, are not mutually exclusive. So you can do them both. Um, but if you don't have time for both, uh, and, you know, again, you know, you can think law review as a student-run publication. You can imagine that time, there's certain points during the semester where there's not a lot going on, right? Um, and then publication time is coming up, and then you're always in the law review office. Um, the same with moot court. There's certain parts of the semester where you're doing a lot of work. Um, you know, getting ready for your competition. But once you memorize the arguments and understand your brief backwards and forwards, it, it gets a little bit easier. Or you might, you know, get knocked out of the competition earlier. It really depends. Um, so, you know, but if I were to say, like, if you could only do one uh, and that's it, then you do law review. Because, again, that, you know, whether you were the octo-finalist in the moot court competition at your school, it won't last on your resume very long. Law review will be on your resume until the day you there's a certain prestige to it, I imagine. Absolutely, yeah. 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 We got a couple of folks asking about books to read before 1L. I mean, obviously there's Love a lot that. of you, yeah. but people are always asking what, what books are out there. I know that you weren't too big on the commercial outlines yep. before starting law school. Is there anything else out there that you think might I be? Got, I've got great ones, all right? Awesome. Uh, and these are written for a lay audience. And if you want some summer reading, this is these, write these two things down. Uh, the first one is written by, a, and this is a, you know, Peyton endorsement of, you know, full disclosure, he's a very good friend of mine. He's the uh, dean of um, University of Texas Law School. Uh, his name is Ward Farnsworth. And the book is called The Legal Analyst. All right. And essentially, it's a really short primer about um, legal theory and how a lawyer thinks. And it's written, again, not from the, um, you know, not from the perspective of somebody who's sitting in a law school classroom, but sitting, you know, if you wanted to understand how a lawyer makes argument, right, understanding a little bit of game theory that it gets into, um, understanding um, the various types of argument and, you know, what a lawyer does and how they craft, you know, their craft is words and how they use those words. Uh, phenomenal book. Written, written for an audience of pe people who are not in law school, right? So that's one. Um, the other book is a book by the name of a, a Boston lawyer. Uh, it's called a civil action. Uh, his name is Jonathan Harr, H-A-R-R. -R. Um, and a civil action, as boring as this might sound, it's, it's about a toxic torts case that takes place in Woburn, Massachusetts, where a lot of people were drinking the water and um, all, you know, this whole community got cancer, right? And essentially this, this, this personal injury lawyer takes this case um, and takes on some very big companies and, you know, who've done some horrible, horrible things. And they destroy him. Um, even though they did everything wrong and they, you know, they deserved to, um, you know, to, you know, be found liable and or even probably even held criminally liable um, in some instances. Um, these, you know, these big law firms just beat the hell out of this, this small per, uh, personal injury lawyer. Um, and the reason why I love it is, first of all, it, it was a movie. It was made by, it was a, made, a movie with John Travolta. Do not see it. It sucked. Um, but the, uh, the, the book is just fascinating in terms of 
you'll take a class during your first year of law school called civil procedure, um, which is basically how a lawsuit proceeds through the court system. A civil case, you know, rather than a criminal case where the state is bringing against the defendant, a civil case is a individual or a corporation versus an individual or a corporation, private citizen, right? Bring a civil action. And um, what I, there's, a, there's an old mantra in, the, in civil procedure, like, you can give me all, you can have all the facts and law on your side, but if I know civil procedure better than you, I'll beat your ass every time. And this is a perfect example of that happening. And it's also like a riveting novel. I mean, like it is a, it is a total turn page, uh, painter, page turn. Um, so those two books should keep people busy, you know, at least through July. Um, and then I, you know, if you're not taking law preview, then, you know, okay. Um, if you do take law preview, like we will have you fully prepped and ready to go. Um, I would recommend doing nothing else other than, you know, getting some sun, you know, sitting your significant other down, explaining about what the next, you know, the next year is going to be like for you and why it's so important that they have to support you. Well, thanks for that breakdown, Don. Those are both great reads that I've heard a lot about, but I actually haven't ever read myself. So oh, I'm telling you, if you, yeah. set, if you picked yeah. up, you know, it, it's, it's not like a, uh, you know, it, it's not up there with like 50 shades of gray, I'm assuming. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's, as, it's as spicy as it gets for a lawyer. A civil action is a really good book. All right, so those will be ranked two and three on my list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got a, got a couple more before yeah. we sign off here. Uh, we got one that I thought was actually a really good question about 1L grades. So yeah. 1L grades, of course, are very important, especially fall semester, but you're applying for a summer associateship before you've gotten back all of your grades from the first year, no? No, so uh, usually, so OCI, which is on-campus interviews, uh, take place in you know early August, beginning of the second semester, right? So the, the, the timing of it is you go through your first year, you'll get your grades you know, back from first semester sometime around middle of January, possibly early February, right? Um, just after, presumably, just after your spring semester check is cleared, they'll give you your grades, right? And be like, ah, surprise, you're staying with us, I guess. Um, so then you'll go through the spring semester and you probably won't get your grades um, until sometime, you know, mid-June, all right? And that's where, you know, yet another thing that you could think about first-year grades being important about is if you want to transfer, right? So the option to transfer is something like, so, you know, again, you know, having gone to, you know, where I went in terms of Albany, um, you know, after my first year, I had an opportunity to transfer to NYU, right? Like really do a, a crazy jump uh, in terms of, um, you know, the rankings of my law school. I didn't take it. You know, I, instead I took the, the law school that actually gave me money, um, you know, to stay. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, a lot of students that we see a lot of students doing, I'm actually having a conference call or call with somebody tomorrow um, from Brooklyn Law School who killed it first semester, is doing really well second semester, wants to transfer to Harvard. We do that all the time. Uh, and we see that happening where students are starting out here but ending up here. Not that Brooklyn's not a good school by any stretch, but like, you know, going to a school like Harvard opens up doors. I mean, it's, it's not fair to say um, that it's in a different league. It's like literally in a different stratosphere uh, in terms of the options that you'll have coming out of school. And that's presumably why you're going to law school, unless you're like an irrational actor and or like a trust fund baby who doesn't care. Um, you know, what, you know, what you're doing in terms of uh, going to law school is to improve your situation. Uh, so a lot of students are using those first year grades in Ju June and July after the first year to transfer to a you know, higher rank school that offers not just a higher ranking, just don't transfer for the rankings, but transfer for the options that you have, you know, whether you want to ultimately get a Supreme Court clerkship or ultimately you want to teach. There's three schools you have to go to, right? Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. Um, you know, 50% of the law professors came from those schools. You know, every other, you know, law professor came from everywhere else, right? So, um, so those, that, that's the, the, like the timing of, you know, the first year of the transfers. And then what will happen is, you know, starting in August, um, you'll start bidding, you know, through your career placement office or the law preview job network is something that we have as well, where firms will contact you and say, Steve, we'd love to have you sit down with two of our associates in the library um, or at a hotel in Manhattan, um, come and spend a half an hour with us and um, an interview with us. Uh, and that's based entirely off your first year grades, right? Entirely off your first year grades. Nothing, they're not looking at anything else. They're not looking at undergraduate transcripts. 
They're not look really. They don't care what's on your resume. Um, it's based on you know, you know, three things. You know, the top three lines of your, you know, of your, uh, actually top, you know, two out of the three lines. They don't care about your name, right? Uh, but they care about where you're going to law school and what your flash rank and GPA is, right? Essentially. Um, so that's you know that happens in the fall semester of your second year, and then what you're doing is trying to get a job for the summer after your second year. Um, and usually that, that process, OCI, uh, results, on-campus interviews results in a callback interview. And by October or November, you've locked that down. And, you know, you're, you're sitting pretty with a job to go and work at the, you know, at the, you know, the following summer, making, you know, at some firms, I don't know, $3,600 a week, you know, which is clearly you're not impressed. Clearly you're, you're a New Yorker. <laughs> you don't care, right? You're like, oh, $3,600 a week. Uh, that's it's like what I spend my month's rent. <laughs> right? No, I mean, like 36, but you can make 30, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, $36,000 over your, um, over your, uh, over your 10 weeks summer associate position. You know, that's like for some people, you know, who don't live in New York City, that's real money, right? So. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for the breakdown, though. It's, it's good to have a picture of how these things come about. And obviously, there's a certain cachet to the brand name of a particular school that opens doors, as well as just where you fall within the class. Right, right. So, I mean, look, you know, honestly, like I said, if I wasn't in the top 10 people of my class, I wasn't going to get the job at the big firm in Manhattan, right? But, you know, if you're in the top 30% at NYU or Columbia, you would. You would have that interview. Um, so, you know, it, but like I talked to a kid today who's going to Harvard, and, you know, he was like, hey, I want to take a law preview because I really want to be. And I was like, well, I mean, like, FYI, you know, if, if you're, I want to go work at you know a large law firm in Manhattan. I'm like, I mean, like, okay, don't kill yourself. Like, you know, not that I don't want to, you know, have you come and take the class, um, but he's like, well, my bigger goal, and that's where, like, you know, is to finish here so I can you know, get a you know appellate court clerkship that will lead to a higher clerkship, which will eventually, you know, have me leaving private practice for a number of years, but coming back as a corner office partner. Oh, okay, well, that makes perfect sense, right? Those are the things that you, th those are the brass rings that the top students at the, you know, the higher rank schools go for. Um, so it, 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 yeah, there's definitely a pedigree. There's definitely a pecking order uh, with all these firms and all the, um, the, the doctors that come out of those, the various firms and or the schools that you go to. What percentage of entering 1Ls do you think have done law preview or something not nearly as good as it, but in the same category, walking in to, to prepare themselves for law school? So it's a great question, and I don't know why it's so small, all right? But, you know, um, so I would be, you know, I know what the numbers are, right? We see about 15 to 1,600 students a year, right? So we're looking at, you know, a market size for a law school prep course of about 5%, right? Not a huge number of students are taking this, um, but I will say this. Uh, you know, when Barbary bought us, uh, you know, the CEO came to me and said, well, what can we do to, you know, to, um, you know, get this from, you know, 1,000 students or 2,000 students to 5,000 students? And I was like, well, let's, you know, all we have is anecdotal evidence. You know, let's hire a third-party, you know, research firm to, you know, survey the students who took law preview, find out where the hell these people are, how'd they do, what was their class rank after the first year, didn't have an impact, Right. And so they went out and, you know, I was too cheap to hire this one, you know, to do this when I was a, uh, you know, owning the business myself, right? We ran it, we ran a very, very close company and, a, you know, very close to the bone. And as I'm, you're an entrepreneur, you know, what sure. um, so, uh, but, you know, somebody else, a larger company wants to do this research, be my guest. Um, so we hired a third party out of, uh, you know, outside uh, organization to do the, the research and the survey and analyze the data and, you know, surveyed about 5,000 kids who took the law preview course over a certain number of years. And, you know, the median class rank, so the median class rank uh, of students who took law preview was the top 16th percentile, right? Wow. So again, I'm not a math guy. I was thinking like, whoa, like, what does that mean? I think median, I think average, I don't know. Like, and they're like, no, this is like, you're moving the needle. But then like other, you know, indicators of success, like 63% of the kids or 66, I, the numbers are on the website. Um, but you know, 66% of the kids ended up with a 2L summer clerkship, right? 33% of them ended up a research assistant or a professor. Like all these hallmarks of, um, 
of, uh, you know, um, uh, first year success, like getting a job, you know, working as a research assistant for a professor, which is a great, that's the best job to get as a 1L summer associate. Um, one thing that I never understood, or I didn't, I, I, I didn't realize it until Barbara required us, because they're the master of the bar exam, right, um, is the, uh, the fact that our, we had a huge, like a really high 80 or 90% bar passage rate, which was, you know, which is pretty high. Um, and, you know, it was explained to me by the folks at, bar, at Barbary is, oh, it makes perfect sense because the best correlation to how well, like to, to whether you pass the bar exam on the first try is how well you do your first year of law school. Uh, one, the subject matter is pretty much the same subject matter that's being tested on the bar exam. And two, it's almost the same replication of the stress that you're under during your first year. If you can manage that first year of stress, you can manage seven weeks of studying for the bar exam. Uh, which is like, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense now. Hindsight, I just never thought about it. Um, so there's all these markers of kids who do it. Now, you can, you know, I'm sure that there's like skeptical lawyers out there, which you know, good, you'll get paid well for this in the future, um, that say, well, you know, you're not really statistically correct because there's probably a self-selection bias of people who were going to take a course like this that are going to do well anyway, uh, or a self-reporting bias, which like they're not going to tell you if you did bad, but they, they're excited to tell you that they did well. Which the researcher said, like, was uh, I, I, don't know, I, I didn't think of that. Like, I'm not a statistician. I'm, what the hell do I know? I'm like, oh, really? Like, I wouldn't even know that was an issue. Um, but they said, like, you know, even accounting for that, like, you know, having a, a median in the 60, top 16th percentile um, is, is really remarkable. You know, so even if you were like in the, the even if we took the median from, because by definition, I guess the median should be 50th percentile. Um, even if we took it from 50 to 40, that would be incredible. But, you know, the fact that we got, a, you know, the median class rank is in the top 16 percentile is pretty easy. Well, regardless, it sounds to me like you would want it, given the massive investment one is making in law school. I saw one calculation that given the tuition and the opportunity cost, it's something like $300,000 all right. said and done. Now, law school tuition alone is maybe 50000 a year with, before accounting for any merit aid. But I'm guessing law preview is a small fraction of that cost. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's 1300 and plus, I mean, most, not most, half of, about half the students don't pay for it. Half the students get picked up by, you know, as, by sponsors. Like, so we'll have, you know, depending on what law school you go to, um, there's, and you can imagine, there's also a pedigree there, right? So, you know, the higher ranked schools have students who, um, you know, might be, you know, more attractive to some firms than other schools, right? Uh, simply because that's where their partners come from and that's where they like to recruit from. Um, so depending on what law school you go to, there's law firms out there that actually sponsor half of our students. Wow. Right. So the half of our students don't pay anything for this class. They just have to pay, you know, travel costs and commuting costs, but that's it. Um, uh, because Latham and Watkins, spon Latham and Watkins sponsored, which is a great, you know, the number one law firm in the world sponsors, you know, 75 kids nationwide. Right. Um, and, you know, it's part, in part because, you know, the head of their diversity and recruiting program was a former law preview student who did really, really well, ended up at Latham Watkins, decided he didn't want to practice law anymore, so he went into the administrative side, um, but saw it as a tool to, you know, ingratiate himself uh, and ingratiate the firm with, you know, in the entering class at NYU, Northwestern, Stanford. Um, and then, you know, as, as soon as they did it, you know, Vincent and Elkins sponsored kids at University of Texas. And then, you know, other firms, Morrison and Forrester sponsors kids at Bolt or at, uh, at uh, Boston College. Um, so, you know, the overwhelming majority of our, I shouldn't say the overwhelming, the half of our students don't pay anything. The other, the other half, I think the average tuition cost after all the discounts is somewhere around $1,100 um, if, they, if, they, if they're they paying for it on their own. But even so, it still seems to me like even, if, still, you're paying, even if, if you're paying sticker. Yeah, it's an insurance policy. And the other thing is that you, know, you have these you know, schools that are giving conditional scholarships, right? That say, basically, Steve, come to our law school. We want to give you a full ride, you know, conditioned on the fact that you're finishing the top 25% of your class after the first year. You can continue to have that full ride, which to some students are like, whoa, like, obviously I'm really smart. They're giving me a full ride. And then they, they get there and they're like, wow, this is really freaking competitive. And, you know, Oh my God, you were also offered a full ride and you were, not everybody's going to keep their full ride. 
right? So there, I guess um, the ABA did a study of the students who were offered conditional scholarships in 2017. And not to blur you with the math, um, it turned out like 28% of the one else who walked in with a conditional scholarship walked out of their first year of law school without a scholarship. So they're paying sticker price because they didn't make the grade second and third year, right? Which is, again, not a position that you want to be in because ideally, you know, pres presumably, right, you're offered a conditional scholarship because what the school did was they bought your number, right? They loved your LSAT score, Steve. They, you took L you know, your LSAT course, you killed it, all right? And now we want to buy your number because that's one number we have to report to the ABA and gets factored in the U.S. News Report and will improve our rankings. So we want to buy your score. We'll give you a, a one-year tuition free at school X and you get to keep that free tuition if you maintain this certain GPA. But because of the 1L grading curve, mathematically everyone cannot keep their, um, their conditional scholarship. Therefore, they find themselves in a position where they, um, you know, they either have to pay sticker price for the remaining two years at a school that might not have been their first choice and they only went there because of the money, right? So they might have they might have gotten into a higher ranked school, um, and said no no I'm going to go to this school because they're offering me a free ride. Well now, I'm paying full full tuition for the last two years of law school, which again fifty grand right a year, so a hundred grand. And in the back of my head, I also know that all the top jobs are gone to the students who did well their first year. So like, what do I do? Do I fish or cut bait at that point? You know, I don't know. It's a tough question. So yeah, yeah. So like when I look at law preview for especially those students, I'm like, are you insane? Like, you know, I am a, you know, I, I might seem like a little bit of a rebel and a risk taker. I am not. All right. I am, you know, a belt with suspenders kind of person. And somebody's going to give me that kind of an offer, you know, to go and do something. Uh, we have a lot of students who come and say like, I'm just simply taking this course to make sure that I maintain the minimum GPA that I don't have to pay full freight for law school. Um, which is a good, and yeah, we had a kid from Creighton Law School who did that. Quinn, I forget his last name. Uh, but he ended up number one in his class. But also was like, hey, the only reason why I took this is because I you know, had a $30,000, a $36,000 a year scholarship and I, I wanted to maintain it. And I'm like, well, you did a little bit better for yourself than that too. And it's like, yeah, it worked out pretty well. Well, to circle back to what we were saying earlier, once again, it's about being risk averse, right? right Future exactly. lawyers being risk averse. You want to keep your scholarship. You want to keep your class rank. 1L grades the way to do it. How do you ensure top 1L grades know what you're going to do before you walk in? Right. And the other beautiful thing about it is if you plan it right, if you do it the right way, right? You might not, I was not a student who they were offering any money to. I think they, they looked at me when I was, and again, you know, I was probably the crappiest student, you know, walking into law school. You, you could have imagined. Um, so when it came to, you know, my second year and I had an opportunity to transfer, you know, there's a lot of power walking down to the, you know, the dean of financial aid and being like, hey, dean, I got a problem. And they're like, what are you, what's your problem? You're number four in the class. You have no problem. I'm like, ah, oh, here's my problem. I got this letter from NYU and Jesus Christ. Nice. They want me to come down there and finish about like two years there. And, you know, immediately what the school was thinking is, okay, we lose this guy. We lose a metric that we need to report to the ABA. Um, what their, uh, what their, um, are they employable within 10 months of graduation? So anybody who's number four in their class is going to get a job, you know, secure a job the summer after their first year, their second year of law school. All right they'll have an offer walking into their third year. Um, also, we know that the best correlation of how well somebody does on the first try of the bar exam is their first year grades. So essentially, these two metrics are going to walk down state and go to our competitor, NYU. Um, and just like Verizon doesn't like to lose a customer to AT&T, law schools will offer retention scholarships. So kids who like myself, were like, they weren't offering me any, you know, scholarship money to come. They thought they were doing me a favor by letting me in the first place. You know, these kids now are turning around and saying, hey, I got a $10,000 retroactive scholarship, right? They, they even applied it to my first year because they didn't want me to transfer. They wanted to retain me here. So that's another, you know, it just, there, there's, a, there's so much that you can do 
with your with a you know a, the commodity of a, a first year transcript and a good first year transcript it's like it's like a commodity but it's like water right like it evaporates very quickly so you have to know how to exercise it what do i want to use that commodity to transfer what i want to use that that commodity to parlay myself into a really good job or a job opportunity that you know frankly you may not like working in a law firm you know in a big firm and that might not be one listen the last thing we need is another you know big law attorney you know we need right now especially right now uh, you know, in the current state of affairs, like we need the people who are really freaking passionate about the law and are looking to, you know, to change things, please God, for the better. Like go to Washington, all right? Lock some people up down there. I won't say who, all right? <laughs> but like, you know, like start rattling some skulls down there. That, that's where we need good lawyers, right? So you might think like, oh, I'm going to do public interest. It doesn't really matter um, how well I do my first year. Well, let me, I'll tell you, A, most public interest lawyers go to big law firms to pay off their debt, right? And even if they don't go there for, um, you know, I wrote an article about this uh, on a blog, uh, you know, that the, you know, most public interest uh, associate in summer, spend a summer as a summer associate because they can make 40 grand, right? And pay down their debt. And, you know, the last one is, you know, the, the, the most famous you know, example of that is Barack Obama, right? At Sidley. Um, you know, was a summer associate with no intention of ever practicing there. Um, but, you know, hey, look, you want to throw some money my way? Like, I'd be a fool to say no um, and pay down my debt. Or a lot of you know, folks will go there, spend a couple of years in a law firm, get some good experience, and then go and save the world. And God knows we need, we need a lot of, we need people out there to save the world. Um, which, if you have one second, I want to do a free, a free plug. We have a, a $10,000 scholarship for, um, yeah, I'm a big believer that, you know, one lawyer can change the world. Uh, so we have a $10,000 one lawyer can change the world scholarship. Uh, all you have to do is write a 500 word essay about how you want to use your law degree to, um, you know, and you plan to use your law degree to change the world and how $10,000 would change yours. Uh, but do me a favor. If you're going to apply for the scholarship, it's on the website. Uh, please, please, please answer the prompt. Don't just attach your, your personal statement because I read all these things. Um, and you know, it, it really gets frustrating when nobody, you know, follows the directions and, or, you know, writes a thousand words. I'm like, no, 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 only 500. So, uh, anything else we got? Uh, I know we, I've talked a lot, so I'm, I'm happy to continue answering questions, but I don't want to you know, take up too much more of your time. If it, if no, this, the, this was, it looks like you're standing. I don't know. Like I'm sitting down. Yeah, I am standing just my setup over here, but this was awesome, Don. And I think this is a, as great a place to end it as we possibly could. One lawyer could change the world. We definitely need some more lawyers in the public interest. And Law Preview, I think, is a great way for folks to get there and make it happen. So I think the URL for you guys is lawpreview.barbary.com. Is that correct? Or you can, we, it, even lawpreview.com will get you there as well. Lawpreview.com. I'll put that in the chat here for folks. And I'll also email it out to everybody who attended afterwards. Don, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for sharing all your advice and wisdom on law school. I know I learned a lot. And I'm sure that everyone watching did too. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Don. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.